You're listening to Two Beers Until Phrenesis, a podcast where we discuss the ideas of philosophy, ethics, religion, history, and culture. Alongside regular guests and friends, we discuss some of life's big questions over a few beers. Enjoy. Set the scene. Well, over 2,000 years ago, in ancient Greece, Plato and Aristotle basically they were the originators of Western thought itself. They were the defining philosophers of the era. And we owe a lot to them intellectually and a bunch of other things. And they laid out all the questions on the table. Uh, what is real? What is truth? How should we act morally? How do we explain the natural world? Since then, the writings of ancient Greece have been received in a lot of different ways around the world. So been kind of rediscovered, deeply coveted, hated, feared, and been seen through the lens of religions as tools to help them sort of defend what they believe. And also it's ended up shaping religion itself. So we're going to talk mainly today about how that's kind of been done with Aristotle in the Islamic world. I guess we could also get onto like how the Christians took Aristotle as well. So, Joe, you wrote an essay for your masters, Birmingham. Indeed. On this whole like Islamic rediscovery of ancient Greece. Mm. Kick us off. So basically, Islamic philosophy as a concept is founded in translations of ancient Greek sources, ancient Greek texts. Mm -hmm. And um, basically my essay was about uh, one of the originators of uh, Islamic philosophy, which is a term that is uh, quite contradictory, but we'll get onto that. And his name was Al-Kindi. He's got, his actual name is like huge. Uh, let's see if I can even try. He's got about eight words in it, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, Abu Yusuf Yaqub ibn Ishaq Al-Sabah Al-Kindi. I've murdered that. You might want to edit that out, but <laughs> we'll, we'll go with our kindy. Yeah, let's. Because I'm not, I'm not going to try and say it. Uh, <laughs> I was kind of endeared towards him because he, he was kind of faced with this insurmountable challenge of trying to convince the Muslim world that Greek philosophy was beneficial to theological debates and that it was actually a primitive form of Islam, almost. Mm. Which, this is probably completely wrong, but kind of, who's the uh, the terrible lawyer in The Simpsons? You know, the one who's like always nervous and like he's like really struggling to do a good job? Lionel Hutz. Right. And he's always like, whenever he does anything, he's really putting his all into it, but like the odds are always somehow against him. You know what I mean? Yeah, a bit of, a, a bit of an underdog. He's a sympathetic character, basically. A bit of an underdog and a bit of a, like, a trier. Yeah. You know, really, he's probably going to fail. Like, his integrity as a, a translator and... Yeah. Yeah, the, the claims he comes out with. He's like, a, he's like a dodgy salesperson. Yeah, there's a bit of... Uh... But it, it's quite endearing, I suppose, because he he really tried to blend the two together, Greek philosophy and Islam, which is a bit of a, yeah, it's just impossible really, without, without undermining both. Yes. Bending as far as you can the core elements of both. They can't go together. Yeah, so I guess in the context, um, I know that the, the, the Umayyads before mm -hmm. that period of Islam, I know they, they saw these kind of uh, classical ideas as basically just completely heretical and, and foreign, and they really didn't want to learn about them. But am I right in thinking that there was a lot of sort of aristocratic and intellectual pressure um, for Al-Kindi to, to do this? He wasn't just like doing it in a complete vacuum. Like, there'd been a lot of conquests and... Oh, no, he, he, he wasn't the only person doing it. Yeah, there was, there was sort of a climate. For, they were already sort of learning a bit of science and stuff, or, or proto-science, I guess, from the ancient Greeks, so why not philosophy, I guess? So, I guess the route it took to come to 
Arabic was that it was being translated into Arabic. It wasn't Greek into Arabic. It was Greek into like Aramaic, Syriac, Syriac, and then Syriac Christians would be translating it into Arabic. Basically, but it was just like a big old, it wasn't Greek, Arabic. It wasn't a direct line. Yeah. It took a lot of loops and different routes to Arabic. I imagine the ideas probably changed a little bit through that process. Yeah, they were, there were probably other Alkindis there trying to, uh, along the way, changing things to suit a purpose. Mm. So Alkindi basically led a school of translators. He couldn't actually read Greek or Aramaic himself or Syriac. He couldn't read any of that or translate it. So he who put him in charge then? Why? why surely he's not that qualified. Well, he he was in good standing with uh, the caliph of the, at the time, and yeah, he educated the caliph's son, who would go on to be another caliph. He's just like a prominent intellectual. That was his patron. His patron was like, "Yeah, go on, go on, go and do this. We'll, we'll support you." It's all about who you know. Yeah, exactly. But I guess the, the, the climate at the time was, so it was a time of expansion yeah. in the uh, Islamic history. And to go along with the sword, I guess, they wanted something for the, the conquested people to believe in. It was an ideological assimilation along with, you know, you are now part of the Islamic yeah. empire. And another way to prove their strength. Yeah, and their, uh, their divine authority. Strength. Yes. So if they could prove somehow that by translating Greek, it was like a proto form of Islam, they just weren't there yet. They hadn't been given the full picture. I guess. I guess that's one of the things about um, that religion. Anyway, it sort of says that all the previous religions are sort of half right and on their way yeah. well, they, they are true they're true in a sense um, that's why I think there's usually more antagonism towards things like Baha'i and Sikhism which come after Islam compared to their relationship historically with Judeo-Christians like, it's like the other two were stumbling around in the dark and they were touching it and they were like oh this it's like the elephant thing like they they're describing parts of an elephant without seeing it and they're all kind of getting the elephant. Christianity's got the trunk and yeah. yeah, Judaism's got the tail. Yeah, and Islam's like, you're kind of right. We're getting there. Yeah. But this is what it is. So what he's sent to do, along with other schools of translators, was to prove that Greek thought could be compatible with Islamic theology. Mm-hmm. This is where things start going downhill because straight away there's opposition from like official theologians because they see philosophy as a undermining not only them mm. but God. And we've got a quote from Al Kindi himself, the man himself, kind of alluding to these these people trying to tell him to don't yeah, you know, don't do this. This is another thing that endears me towards him because he was like I don't know, he was like snidey. Yeah, I think I know the quote you're talking about. It is a little bit... No. It's like, okay, uh, a filthy envy abides their bestial souls, which is already, that, that as a starting point, that's some good, like, mm. you know. A filthy envy abides their bestial souls, which shields the vision of their thought from the light of truth with dark veils. So, I'll carry on, but we'll talk about the light of truth already. Yeah, so he, yeah, he sees some truth in, well, I, I guess conceptually reason uh, as opposed to revelation. He thinks that th- they are two sides of the same coin. Mm. They, the, 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 the truth present in kind of what uh, I guess mainly Aristotle was doing with using logic and syllogisms was kind of the same thing that, that they're doing later with uh, the Quran. Yeah. So there's whether that's true or not is uh, I know different. Um, yeah. And he kind of in this the same quote 
<laughs> he he's saying, um, we beseech him who can see into our heart, uh, who knows our efforts to establish proof of his divinity. He's like, not only are we trying to prove that Hellenism is compatible with Islam, but the methods that are contained within the text will prove divinity, that prove that God exists. Like there's methods here that give us the tools that we are missing at that time is what he's trying to say. Which, you know, if you're trying to sell something, it's not a bad it's not a bad line to go down, I don't think. Yeah, it certainly helps him flog it. Yeah, exactly. Throughout this whole thing, he's just saying stuff that I think he thinks people want. It's like the Wolf of Wall Street sell me this pen. He's just chucking everything at you. Uh, this, you know, Greek philosophy can do anything. Mm. Yeah, what he's done is like basically said that if you don't like philosophy, you don't like your own religion. Mm. He said, like, he actually says that because they're both sort of uh, advocating a, a search for truth. Basically, says it's unbelief to not like philosophy at all. Mm. Um, and I think I don't, I'm not like totally against that definition of philosophy either. I do kind of think it is a search for truth. So I think he's, I, you know, I think that's that's probably the right way to go about it. I think th- probably the difference we'll get onto is that I don't think philosophy is supposed to find truth, whilst I think religion is. Well, yeah. And I, I think, yeah, one's an open conversation, one's a closed conversation. But, uh, yeah. Well, I, I suppose the, the one thing that we can leave this whole section on his aim with is another quote, which basically sums up his approach to translation, uh, which is, uh, we must not be ashamed to admire the truth or to acquire it from wherever it comes, even if it should come from far-flung nations and foreign peoples. Basically, that sums him up. He's saying, to the haters, he's saying, right, this is the truth, and we shouldn't be ashamed to look for it in these texts. So shut up, I'm going to do it. Mm. I think there's a bit of a parallel, actually, with um, Aristotle wasn't actually Greek. He was probably from Turkey. He was kind of a, a foreigner in, in the land that he was writing in. See outside of the box, in a certain sense. Or, or at least be open to ideas, yeah, like you said, no matter where they come from. Did you want to talk in any more detail about the kind of things that Al Kindi was sort of writing about and what translating and what concepts he tried to flog? Yeah, sure. Like the major thing that is associated with Al Kindi when it comes to translation is something he called the theology of Aristotle. Mm-hmm. Of course, he did go on after translating things and produce his own philosophical ideas. But for translation, which was the first introduction of Greek thought to the Islamic world, his circle translated something called the Theology of Aristotle, which mm-hmm. in itself is, you know, the theology of Aristotle. Yeah, it's not, it's not <laughs> really like... That's a straight away a lie. If you've got in the back of your mind that he, whatever he's doing is selling, he's like a salesperson at heart. So the theology of Aristotle wasn't Aristotle. It was the Enneads. So they'd translated Plotinus's Enneads and labelled it the theology of Aristotle, right? Yeah. So uh, uh, how did you say his name? Because I've always said Plotinus. I thought it was Plotinus. It probably is Plotinus. Anyway, so yeah, Plotinus is a Neoplatonist. Yeah. Yeah, he, he had translated a bunch of... Uh, things from Aristotle and basically made them out to be a lot more religious than they actually were. So it's worth bearing in mind, Aristotle is a complete materialist. He's arguably the first, he's very similar to a scientist, I'll put it that way. He believes strongly in a kind of monism, a kind of material, materialistic 
world. He's not particularly interested in anything outside of logic. In fact, uh, like intuitive knowledge, which is, I guess, comparable to like divine knowledge, he would either reject that as complete superstition or at least say it was subsidiary to philosophical insight, not superior to it. So to say, so even with the title Theology of Aristotle is yeah. a complete contradiction of, you know, it's not Aristotle. Yeah, he's going to have to twist a lot of Aristotle's theories. And to be honest, Aristotle's method, the method of logic, the method of reason, in order to demonstrate this kind of thing. So the actual content of the theology, as we said, is Plotinus's work. Now, Plotinus a Neoplatonist <laughs> is in contradiction with Aristotle anyway. Right, the things he is saying is a continuation of Plato, who is very different to Aristotle anyway. Yeah. So, I, I get the, the general consensus, like the academic consensus, is he Al Kindi was trying to present philosophy as a complete body of thought without any like disputing elements within it. So, if he could just basically cut and paste elements from different. Greek philosophers to make them say one whole thing. Yeah, so to, to try and say that Plato and Aristotle are saying the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that's pretty that's pretty bold. That's yeah. that's quite a hard thing to achieve. Like yeah, I can see why you like him. And he was going about it and he was like and he would he would completely change the order of sentences. Not translation does that anyway, just for readability. Yeah. But he would change concepts in the yeah, way... impact the meaning. Exactly. In the essay I talked about, one of the extracts from the Aeneas books 4 to 6, within that there's this, this quote, which is one of the most obvious changes in meaning. Uh, Plotinus talks about the one, which he describes as like the fundamental principle of reality, kind of like the unmoved mover. Like the the very first thing, mm, Aristotle's uh, logical idea of God. Yeah, which the the idea the concept the one is quite easily comparable to the Islamic God, like the mono to an extent. The, yeah, the, yeah, the mono. Like he was heavy on the uh, Arkindi was heavy on stressing God's oneness. He read this and thought, you know what, this is a link I can make. Okay, mm. but in the in the quote in the original. Uh, the one is all things and is not one thing, for it is the principle of all things, but is not one of those things, though all things are like it, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's like the core element of everything, and things have shared commonalities, like, like I am like the one, basically, is the gist of it. But in the translation, this is the translation, the pure one is the cause of all things, not like any of the things, Rather, he is the beginning of the things. He is not the things, but the things are in him. He is not anything, but all things pour forth from him. Do you see the difference? Yeah. <laughs> he just decided to ram it full of Islamic concepts. He's changed it into uh, emanationism. Well, emanationism, and he's, put, he's thrown in the cause in there as well. Yeah. So it's gone from just this isolated uh, self-thinking intellect to something more immediate, more causal. Yeah. yeah, when really Aristotle's God lacks any sort of relational relationship. Yeah, <laughs> one of those relational with, relationships. With, yeah, one of those. One of those. Yeah. So this is just kind of an indication of the length he would go to to present and sell. Greek philosophy in his translations. Well, it's not even his trans his circles translations. Like he would package it as a completely different thing, which I think undermines his mission. Basically, yeah. Oh, I th I think I think he understood the reason and logic of Aristotle enough to use it effectively in some places, and I think it it sort of had been being used before with. 
I think they were using it to like say why the Trinity was like a load of bollocks, for instance. They would use sort of rational argumentation to do that. But in in terms of like cementing theory about God, that hadn't that hadn't really been done. It's more just to like put other religions down at this point. Well, before the introduction of like Greek method into theological debates about the Trinity, there was a, a theological school called the Mutazilite school. Mm-hmm. And their approach to say the Trinity was you could say comparable to to the the rational argument element of Greek philosophy. But the thing that prevented it from being fully just philosophy was that all of their arguments relied on scripture. Like scripture would never be confronted. It would never be, oh well scripture says this, so it must be. That was that was the core of their, all of their arguments. Yeah, I think this is what we're getting onto, like the the main conceptual thing that's going on here. The difference between somebody doing philosophy and somebody using philosophy. Because I think this guy is a, a theologian who is using philosophy as opposed to a philosopher. Because I think philosophy is uh, not only an unrestricted conversation, but I also think, I don't really think you can be fully, seriously religious and be a philosopher. I think you can engage with philosophical questions and be philosophical, but I don't think you can actually be a philosopher and be religious. There are a lot of exceptions to that, but as a general rule, especially at this point in history, I think that's true. But this is basically the authority for someone like Al-Kindi lies entirely in revelation and not logic. So to be fair, it's quite a fucking gamble to even try and do this, because, you know... Yeah, well, at, at the time... The, the Metazolite school was the official doctrinal school. Like it had caliphate authority behind it. It was like, you know what? No. At a time when people were, you know, their heads were getting lopped off. <laughs> like, and put on spikes and all kinds of stuff. He stood his ground. Pretty sure that still happens <laughs> in some places. Yeah, but you know, this was like, Oh, what happened to Gary? Oh, his, his head was lobbed off. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> this is it's like a common, mm. you know. Just for having like different ideas. Yeah. So not only is, is he like a failing salesman, he's a ballsy failing salesman. It's like an, he's like an 80s salesman. Just really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's like, have you ever seen the film The Founder? No. It's about um, Ray Kroc and McDonald's. Right, yeah. Ray, Ray Kroc was like a traveling salesman uh, selling like milkshake machines. He was, <laughs> he would just come up with all sorts of bullshit to, to sell milkshake machines. And then he eventually uh, conned the McDonald's brothers out of McDonald's and became a billionaire. Well, anyway, that's what he reminds <laughs> me of. Yeah, no, I can see that. But yeah, I don't, I don't think he's doing anything too radical because like, he still commits to the authoritative nature of revelation mm. versus like the logical truth you might find in a axiomatic syllogisms, the sort of like, you know, if, if, uh, if, if I think the example you use is, or the example in your notes was about, um, all dogs bark. Lassie is a dog. Therefore Lassie barks. Yeah. That, that's kind of, that's like the most simple. Yeah. They get very complicated, very fast, but like, if you take certain premises to be true and follow them to their natural conclusions, it's inarguable. It's like you you can't actually argue with maths because it is maths. That's the like the core of the philosophical approach to arguments. Well, to arguments and to some people to anything. Like some philosophers are like, well, you can't prove anything at all unless there's a an argument behind it, which is very fucking annoying. Yeah, well, thinking of like logical, logical positivists oh, and things in the 40s God. who were like, these are the only statements that can be true. Um, the only type of knowledge. Um, but yeah, I, I, think, I think what this might confuse in a way, and this is probably more the crux of my essay, um, is the apparent contradistinctive dichotomy between propositions in philosophy and statements of faith 
in religiosity. Mm. I don't think they're the same type of thing. I think a religious claim is not a proposition. It's not a scientific statement. Well, there's always a gap. There's always yeah. a, well, we can't, there's always the, the gap of faith. I actually think because of people like Al Kindi, we've sort of confused the two in like the modern day. And I think there's a lot of other things that have gone into it. But I think, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's really cool how this guy fucking knew there was a massive gap and he still, he was going, yeah, this, was, this, was bef- this was before it got confused. And he, he just went, well, no, I'm going to fucking ram them both together. Well, it was like a, a huge balancing act that he had to do because he had to, first of all, please the the Muslims in charge who at any point could have just locked his head off, as Fu said. And yeah, he was just balancing religion and philosophy, which is, is kind of just impossible to, <laughs> to to get a perfect harmony between the two in his own writing and in the translations, which is why you find he does yeah. sneaky things that, you know, at the time people wouldn't have known any different because there were no other translations. So your, your conclusion was basically that he achieved it in a practical sense, right? You see, now I'm thinking about it, I don't think it's fair to say that he harmonized them. He harmonized the two because I just don't think that's possible. I think it had the appearance of, of It was like a fake harmony. <laughs> it was like a convincing lie. A magic act. Yeah. Yeah. He was trying to balance the two, but there are elements of his work where he shows favoritism to, to one of, over the other. One of those, which is quite clear, is the eternity of the world. Now, the eternity of the world for the Greeks would have just been common sense. Yeah. For the Greeks, there is no starting point. There is just like, time is infinite. It's just a big continuum, especially for Aristotle. Yeah, so the universe is brute fact. Yeah, it's, it's just there. But obviously in Abrahamic religions, the major fact of God is his role in creation. It's, that's the first thing he does for us is create us, right? So if the world is eternal, there is no creator. That's just complete, it completely undermines God, right? Mm-hmm. Are you following me so far? Yep. So our kindy sets about systematically destroying arguments of the eternity of the world through axiomatic arguments. I like it because it is just annoying the way he goes about it. It's like we were talking about earlier. All dogs bark, Lassie is a dog, so Lassie barks. Yeah, deductive reasoning. It's like that, but, but ramped up. So it's like, oh, for God's sake. Like, you can't argue with it because by the logic of the argument, it's correct. But it's just annoying. Yeah, if, if, you, if you agree with the, the premise, then the conclusion you, you have to agree with, yeah. This is another reason why I like Plato as well. Well, Plato's writing of Socrates. Because Socrates would just go around annoying people with logical arguments. Mm. Like he would just be walking around. But anyway, it basically he was trying to prove that there could be nothing that was infinite. Infinity was just a, like a, a wrong concept, right? Yeah. So this is how he tried to do it. Basically, he's saying if you've got an infinite amount of something, say you've just got, I don't know, an infinite pile of books right? And you take away from that, what have you got? This is a question. Uh, A finite amount of books. Yeah, you've got two finite amount of books, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got like a huge pile of books and a smaller pile of books. And if you try and put that smaller pile of books back onto the large pile of books, is it infinite again? Was his kind of like question. Yeah, it's nonsensical. It just doesn't, yeah. What amount makes something infinite? Like the smaller pile of books adds on to the larger pile of books and it can't make it infinite again because infinite doesn't have a certain number, right? Yeah, how much do you have to add to something to, to make it... To something finite yeah. to make it infinite? Yeah. Well, you'd have to add infiniteness to it. Which, so he's saying that's, that's just bollocks, yeah, you can't yeah. do that. 
Mm. So that, that was one of his arguments. He just keeps like coming up with these, well, basically, infinities are loads of bullshit kind of arguments. Until he, yeah. until he gets to um, this one, which is a very subtle argument. He says, it, it is impossible for past time to be infinite or any time to be infinite because if it were infinite into the past, one would not reach any specified time at all. Now, when you listen to that, you're like, well, yeah, you can. Like, I can reach the year 2020. Like, we've done it. We've reached the year 2020. Yeah. He, his argument is, if you travel the length of infinity in the past to now, you can measure that time, right? Yes. But how can you measure it if it extends infinitely in the past? Like, there's no starting point. So if one came from infinity to now and then traveled from now back to that point, you would say that they've traveled an equal amount of time, right? No, you lost me there. Okay, okay. This is probably me getting confused as well. But infinity to now, right? Yeah. If you traveled from infinity to now and stopped. Yep. Right? And then from now... You're like, oh, I've done what I've done here, and then go back, right? Right, yeah. Go back to what? Because it's infinite. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those where you're like, what are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I'm sure that's probably been solved with maths. Or I'm sure it has. Bit. Yeah. But it's one of those where you're just like, you're confused into, <laughs> into them. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just smoke and mirrors <laughs> the entire time. It's just... He'll use logic when it's vague enough to <laughs> sort of uh, conceal most of the steps. Yeah. But, so he's trying to say that you can't traverse infinity because when you get to it, an end point, like, but there is no end to infinity. Mm. Are you with me? Yeah, no, I'm with you. Like, you. You can't travel somewhere along an infinite scale and arrive at anywhere. Because that constitutes like an end, like a present. It's it's one of those. It's just like what the Okay. Mm, it's fucky. <laughs> I'm taking that science as like dismissive. No, I yeah. I <laughs> I don't I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I understand. Well I'm glad someone does. I don't I don't know whether it's true. I don't think it's as, as much of a paradox as he thinks it is. Well he's like, well that Obviously, infinity can't be a thing. And like, what? what? He, he, this is like his grand argument, mm. which itself is taken from someone else. This was, this is a John Philoponus. Oh God, John Philoponus was a, a Christian philosopher before him. Papadopoulos. John, yeah, uh, John, <laughs> Papadopoulos, John, um, who who basically said there couldn't be any such thing as an infinite series, not infinite time. But he just takes that and... Applies it to time, yeah. Applies it to time, saying, because there can't be any infinite amount of time, there must have been a starting point, and God is the person to create the starting point. So this whole logical, like, tying in knots is just to prove that there is a creator. Mm. So this is an example of where the Islam side of the scale gets a bit heavier than the, the philosophy side of the scale. If you see what I mean, he, he's trying to balance the two, but for some reason, it might have been external pressure. This is something we can't budge on. He is saying, yeah, no, this is where they got it wrong. This is, although I've previously said the Greek philosophers were proto-Muslims, this is wrong. And this is it's kind of an indication of a larger problem with his whole mission. Like, what you were talking about, you can't be a, a religious philosopher. This just kind of proves why. It's similar to Aquinas, where he was thinking, Aristotle is the philosopher. He was great. He's burning in hell. But <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, oh yeah, no, this is right. Of course, it's, of course it's not right, because we're right now. <laughs> But yeah. Yeah, it's right enough that I couldn't maybe use it to do some smoke and mirrors shit 
and, and and back us up. Yeah, just just as a as a crutch, but nothing. I don't. I don't really think he's using the principles of philosophy. I don't think. I like you, like you were saying. I I I think he's sort of undermining the very foundation of philosophy by using it in this way. He's not really using philosophy. He's basically using the theory and not the method. So he's using like the content of what Aristotle says. Even then, he's twisting it. But he's not thinking about how Aristotle came to that conclusion unless he's doing some weird uh, argument about causality that's not even his you know yeah but yeah he's he's just he's sort of going well okay Aristotle kind of thought something about unity and a self-thinking intellect so I'll just kind of do some misdirection and and misread it and just say yeah no it's that's kind of similar to our God but then he goes on to like completely disprove what he's said, but also suggesting that he's using the, the philosophical method to disprove philosophy, in a way. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, to be fair to him, there is some reasoning going on here. It's not just like, he's not just pulling things totally out of the air. Like, he is, there is some method. The core premise and an argument built around that, but it is, mm. like, convoluted, and you have to cross off all the alternate answers, right? You have to say, well, it could be this. This is why it isn't this. Well, it could be this. This is why it isn't this. When you're coming up with a philosophical argument, right? You have to, like, cover the bases. Mm-hmm. And he just kind of jumps that bit and goes, there you go, ha! I was right. And you're just like, you're left with a lot of questions. Yeah, I think there are very good reasons for that to do with theology. To be honest, there's probably not that much of a backdrop for these kinds of conversations. It's a really interesting time. You know, he's he's drawing upon like what a few Christian philosophers, if you can call them that, theologians really, um, and Neoplatonists. But to be honest, the big stuff happened with Plato and Aristotle. Since then, you know, you've had the decline of the Roman Empire and it's just been a complete desert of thought. And it's it continues to be after this as well. Like the I guess the the early Islamic philosophy and the I don't know if you want to call it like the Islamic Enlightenment uh, was was like a bright spot in otherwise just no real novel ideas. I tend to think they were always read, but imagine discovering Aristotle, literally the the foundation of science, the entire the entire Christian world, like the the best philosopher we got out of that. And again, I, I'm not really sure if philosopher is the right term for him, but it was Aquinas and Aquinas wasn't really coming up with anything amazingly new. He just covered a massive scope of things, you know, comparable to Plato. Actually, I think he spoke about so many different things, but yeah, it's, it's cool. Cause it's, it's not, I don't think it's complete apologetics. I don't think it's complete. Like, Oh, how can we defend whatever? He, he seems to have some sort of interest in Aristotle. I mean, what would you say? Do you think do you think he actually cares about Aristotle at all? Or do you think he's just trying to use Aristotle? I think he does care about Aristotle. But I think he was stuck in a time where he couldn't care too much. Mm. Like he couldn't openly commit. Whereas after him, Islamic philosophers did openly contradict like the core tenets. Other philosophers that followed him like Avicenna and Alfarabi they did think the world was eternal and disagreed with him on core things like that. But for Al-Kindi, he was like stuck between a rock and a hard place, basically. You couldn't be yeah. too committal to like anything. Once he'd, once he'd said Greek philosophy and Islam are the same but different, he was fucked. Like he he shot himself in the foot because he had to... like back that up which you know you can't really I think yeah I think there was a reason why later philosophers and theologians couldn't intellectually marry these ideas because they can't be and I think yeah the more time they were given to explore both the more they kind of realized yeah these these things don't easily fit together it's not as simple as Alkindi tried to present they didn't fit into his light of truth no like prediction 
you know, unfortunately. And he wasn't, he was kind of overlooked being one of the first people to introduce Hellenistic thought after that, Mm. when more famous philosophers came about. Like, he wasn't read, which is a tragic end to this man's tale. Mm. I think I just feel sorry for him, really. I'm like, he tried his best. Yeah, I do a bit. There's something, like, about people who have, that, that believe something can be beneficial for people so much, and yet, like, they're just really wrong. Yeah, and history, and, and history says differently. Yeah. There's something endearing about the struggle. weird crap right here have this glow slime have have like a barrel of slime that's cool (laughs) throw it at your mates (laughs) you know the one you stuck your finger in it sounded like a fart yeah yeah (laughs) okay aristotle 